Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and for this lesson we will be learning about enzymes. And by now you may be a little familiar with enzymes. During our lesson on proteins, I briefly mentioned that enzymes are responsible for the chemical reactions in living cells. So just for fun, I tried looking up how many chemical reactions are actually happening in a human body every second. And not surprisingly, there is really no definitive answer to this question. First, I found out that the number of chemical reactions happening in a single cell is huge and varies tremendously depending on the type of cell, which makes sense because some cells are more active than others. So the number of chemical reactions could be anywhere between several hundred million to several billion chemical reactions per second. So let's say a reasonable average is about a billion chemical reactions per second per cell. Since by some accounts there are an estimated 37.2 trillion cells in the human body, then if we do the math, there could be around 37 billion billion chemical reactions per second. That's a lot of chemical reactions. And what's crazy is that each chemical reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme. Now if enzymes did not exist, the chemical reactions in our body could still happen, they would just happen too slowly for our bodies to survive. So because chemical reactions in our bodies must happen very quickly for cells to function properly, they need to be helped along, and that helper is an enzyme. Enzymes are what we call biological catalysts. What that means is that they help chemical reactions in living cells so that they happen much faster than they would without them. What enzymes do, essentially, is lower the activation energy at which a reaction occurs. This graph here shows how enzymes speed up a chemical reaction. Remember that in a chemical reaction, the reactants, shown here on the left, interact to form a product, shown here on the right. The wall that separates them represents the activation energy. You can think of the activation energy as an energy speed bump. The larger the speed bump for the chemical reaction, the slower the reaction. The yellow wall represents the activation energy of a chemical reaction without an enzyme, and the orange wall represents the same reaction with an enzyme. As you can see, the orange wall is a lot lower. This is because the enzyme physically brings the reactants together, and by doing so, it lowers the energy that is needed to get the reaction started, which essentially speeds up the chemical reaction. Notice that the enzyme does not influence the energy level of the reactants or the products, only the activation energy, the amount of energy that is needed to get the reaction started. So enzymes are proteins. Like all proteins, they have a very specific three-dimensional shape that determines their function. For enzymes, the 3D shape is specific to the chemical reaction it catalyzes. And enzymes have a place in their structure called the active site. This is the place where enzymes come in contact with the reactants from the chemical reaction. The reactants of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction are called substrates. The shape of the active site is what makes enzymes specific to the chemical reactions they catalyze. And not all enzymes work on all substrates, the same way that locks and keys are specific to each other. There are two models used to describe the way enzymes interact with substrates. The first and older model is called the lock and key model. According to the lock and key model, the enzyme's active site complements the substrate precisely. The substrate fits into a particular active site, like a key fits into a particular lock. This model of enzyme-substrate interaction is good at explaining how enzymes exhibit specificity for a particular substrate. A second, more recent model used to describe how enzymes work is called the induced fit model. And according to the induced fit model, the enzyme's active site is not a completely rigid fit for the substrate. Instead, the active site will undergo a slight change in shape when exposed to a substrate in order to improve binding to that substrate. This theory of enzyme-substrate interaction has two advantages compared to the lock and key model. First, it explains why enzymes sometimes experience broad specificity. For example, lipase is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of many different types of fats because it can bind to a variety of lipids, not just one. And second, it also explains how an enzyme goes about catalyzing a reaction. 
Enzyme catalysis may occur because the change in shape the enzyme undergoes stresses the bonds in the substrate or brings substrates together in just the right way to form new bonds. Essentially, once the substrate or substrates attach to the active site, the enzyme provides the conditions for the chemical reaction to occur and form the product. And this is what lowers the activation energy. And enzymes can lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction in three ways. One of the ways the activation energy is lowered is by having the enzyme bind two of the substrate molecules and orient them in a precise manner to encourage a reaction. Another way enzymes can lower the activation energy is by rearranging the electrons in the active site so that there are areas that carry partial positive and areas that carry partial negative charges, which then favor a reaction to occur within that site. And lastly, the enzyme can strain the substrate, forcing it to a transition state that favors a reaction. So by manipulating the substrates within the active site, an enzyme can lower the necessary energy that is needed to make the reaction happen. And it is very important that you understand that the enzyme itself is not a component of the chemical reaction. It is not a reactant and it is not a product. And it is not used up in any way during the reaction. So an enzyme is the same molecule at the beginning of the reaction as it is at the end of the reaction and can therefore be used over and over and over again to catalyze the same chemical reaction many times. And that doesn't mean that every enzyme that is needed to catalyze every single chemical reaction in our cells is constantly at work. Because enzymes guide and regulate all the chemical reactions in an organism. By the way, this is something we collectively call the metabolism of an organism. Enzymes then tend to be carefully controlled. Besides producing more or less enzymes as needed, there are several factors that can control and affect the activity of enzymes. Factors which can influence the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction include temperature, pH, and substrate concentration. So the rate of a reaction between an enzyme and its substrate is dependent on temperature. Let's start by looking at this graph that illustrates this. So in this graph, we have the temperature on the x-axis and the rate of chemical reaction on the y-axis. The rate refers to how quickly the enzyme is working. As the temperature increases, the rate of the reaction will also increase, but only up to a point, and then it's going to drop sharply right after that. So the optimal temperature is the temperature when the reaction rate is at its highest. For a lot of human enzymes, the optimal temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature. But the optimal temperature can vary depending on the type of organism. For example, there are species of heat-tolerant bacteria that live in geysers and other really hot environments, and their enzymes have an optimal temperature close to 80 degrees Celsius. So obviously there can be a range in the optimal temperature, but most living things will find that their optimal temperature for enzyme reaction is between 37 and about 40 degrees Celsius. But let's explore why temperature has this effect on an enzyme's activity. What is happening in this graph? So first we saw that as the temperature increased, so did the rate of enzyme activity. And this is because as the temperature increases, so does the energy, more specifically the kinetic energy, of both the reactants and the enzymes. And this increased energy means that the substrates are more likely to encounter the enzyme and to do so with more energy that allows the reaction to happen. So the higher the temperature, the higher the reaction rate because the more energy both the enzyme and the substrates have. But when the optimal temperature is surpassed, the enzyme reaction rate drops sharply. And the reason for that is because at high temperatures, proteins can be denatured. And because enzymes are proteins, they also are denatured by high temperatures. When an enzyme is denatured, it loses its shape. And without the right shape, the enzyme cannot interact with the substrate anymore. So this is how temperature affects enzyme activity. At first, it speeds up the rate of enzyme reaction by increasing the energy that is available for both the substrate and the enzyme. But when it gets too hot, the rate of reaction drops to zero as the enzymes become denatured due to the amount of heat.
Another factor that affects enzyme activity is the pH. So we have another graph, and this time we're placing the pH of the solution in the x-axis. Now enzymes also have an optimal pH upon which they work well, which in this graph would be right here, where the rate is at its highest. And most enzymes work well at a pH value somewhere close to neutral, so close to 7, but somewhere between 6 and 8, most likely. But that's not the case for all enzymes. Some enzymes work well at much lower pH values or at higher pH values. For example, the digestive enzyme pepsin works best at the highly acidic pH found in the stomach. Another digestive enzyme works best at a slightly basic pH found in the small intestine. Now, both enzymes break down proteins, but work in different environments within the digestive tract, so have different optimal pH values as a result. So let's explore the reason for the shape of the curve for these graphs. And remember from our lesson on proteins that acids can also denature an enzyme. So as the pH drops, the enzymes stop working as well since enzymes are denatured at pH values lower than the optimal pH. And they are also denatured by bases at pH values higher than the optimal pH. So pH affects the rate of enzyme activity. And as you can see, there is a pH range upon which an enzyme works, but values outside of that range denature the enzyme, bringing the reaction rate to zero. A third factor that affects the rate of enzyme activity is the concentration of the substrate. So this graph will show substrate concentration in the x-axis. And as you increase the concentration of the substrate, the enzyme activity increases. But at some point, the rate of the reaction is going to level off. This maximum rate at which the reaction is going to level off is called the saturation point. But why? What is happening in this graph? Why is that reaction rate leveling off at some point, even though the substrate concentration keeps increasing? Well, at first there are going to be more enzymes for a little bit of substrate. The reaction rate is low because there is not enough substrate to be catalyzed and a lot of enzymes not being utilized. Essentially, there's way too much enzyme and not enough substrate. As more substrate becomes available, more enzymes can get busy catalyzing the reaction, increasing the rate, until eventually all the enzymes are working at full capacity. The saturation point has been reached and all the enzymes are occupied. None are searching for substrates. Increasing the concentration of the substrate will have no effect on the rate of the reaction. At this point, what may increase the rate of the reaction would actually be adding more enzymes and increasing the concentration of enzymes so it can match the concentration of substrate. How fast an enzyme works can be affected by inhibitors and activators. Some enzymes are only active when bound to helper molecules that are called cofactors or coenzymes. Cofactors are often inorganic ions, so the minerals that we take in our diet, for example, act as cofactors. Zinc and magnesium are common cofactors. Coenzymes, on the other hand, are organic in nature and are mostly derived from vitamins or other essential nutrients. But essentially, cofactors and coenzymes complete the enzyme shape so that they can catalyze a chemical reaction. Some enzymes are inactive until a coenzyme or a cofactor has bound to them in order to fully activate the enzyme. And unlike cofactors and coenzymes which activate an enzyme by promoting the interaction between the enzyme and the substrate, an enzyme inhibitor is a molecule that does the opposite. So in a normal reaction, a substrate binds to an enzyme via the active site to form an enzyme-substrate complex, and then the products are released. Inhibitors essentially disrupt this interaction between enzyme and substrate. And they can be either competitive or non-competitive depending on their mechanism of action. Competitive inhibition involves a molecule other than the substrate binding to the enzyme's active site. And the inhibitor is structurally and chemically similar enough to the substrate that it can fit into the active site and bind to it, essentially blocking the active site and preventing the substrate from binding to it. Non-competitive inhibition, on the other hand, involves a molecule binding to a site other than the active site. This site is called an allosteric site. And the binding of an inhibitor to the allosteric site causes the enzyme's active site to change in shape. 
And as a result of this change, the active side and substrate no longer share specificity, meaning that the substrate cannot bind to the active side and the enzyme can no longer do its job. Competitive and non-competitive inhibition tend to affect the rate of a chemical reaction differently. Since the inhibitor is in competition with the substrate, the effects of competitive inhibitors can be reduced by increasing the concentration of the substrate. When the concentration of the substrate is increased, the enzyme is more likely to encounter the substrate rather than the inhibitor, so the effects of competitive inhibition on the reaction rate of the enzyme can be mitigating by an increase in substrate concentration. On the other hand, since non-competitive inhibitors are not in direct competition with the substrate, increasing substrate levels cannot reduce the inhibitor's effect on the enzyme. As we saw with non-competitive inhibition, the action of an enzyme can be affected even when molecules bind outside the active site. And this type of enzyme regulation is called allosteric regulation. Allosteric regulation, broadly speaking, is just any form of regulation where the cell controls the activity of an enzyme by the use of some regulatory molecule, either an activator or an inhibitor, which is actually most often the case. And these regulatory molecules bind to the enzyme someplace other than the active site. The place where the regulator binds is called the allosteric site. So we often see allosteric regulation at work via a process called feedback inhibition. In the process of feedback inhibition, the end product of a metabolic pathway allosterically inhibits a key enzyme of that pathway. Feedback inhibition is a very clever way for the cell to make just the right amount of a product. When there's little of the product, the enzyme will not be inhibited and the pathway will go full steam ahead to replenish the supply. But when there's lots of the product sitting around, it will block one of the enzymes in the pathway of its production and therefore it will prevent the production of a new product until the existing supply has been used up, at which point the product will no longer inhibit its own production. And so that's it for the factors that affect the rate of enzyme activity. And that's it also for our lesson on enzymes. Talk to you soon.